paradox is something that appears to contradict itself. It's a statement that quite often is completely at odds with what your logical mind expects. In fact, some paradoxes are so illogical that we can't accept them even when presented with evidence backing up the statement. My favourite paradox is the birthday paradox. It's got it all. It's got a statement that seemingly defies belief and it's got a mathematical answer that we can test and prove it to be true. But even when we've done the maths or math for half of my audience, we're still not entirely convinced. Here's the statement of the birthday paradox. In a room of 23 people, the chances of two people sharing a birthday are 50%. There may be people watching now who are expert mathematicians who have no problem whatsoever immediately accepting that statement. But for the rest of us, it's fair to say that we do need a little bit of convincing. Let me say that again. In a room of 23 people, the chances of two people sharing a birthday are 50%. 50%! It's the same odds as a coin toss. If you're in a pub with 22 other people, there's a one in two chance that someone in there shares a birthday with someone else. Only 23 people are required for the chances to be evens for a birthday match. Bring this up with a friend or a colleague and see how far you get with it. Unless they're a mathematical wizard, they, like me, will struggle to accept the statement. 23 people isn't very many. You could send 22 messages to your Facebook contacts to people whose birth dates are unknown to you and ask them to reply with their date of birth. So that's you and 22 others in a virtual Facebook room. 23 in total. It's a 50% chance that somewhere in that group of 23, there's a birthday match. To give a real world test to this, I asked my audience on a community post to let me have their birth date. At the time of recording, there were 114 respondents. If we add me as a respondent, that's 115, which conveniently allows us to split the list into five rooms, each containing 23 people. I asked people to use the UK date format DDMM. And then, starting from oldest comment to newest comment, I filled five virtual rooms until all rooms contained 23 people. Immediately in room one, after a comparison of the first 23 dates of birth, we had a match. Two people People shared the 13th of Feb as their date of birth. With the next 23 comments, I made a second room and I had another birthday match. Two people were born on the 15th of Feb. For the next group of 23, there was no birthday match, but there was for room four. Two people shared a birthday of the 20th of August. In the final room, there was a match again. Two people had the 30th of August as their date of birth. Five virtual rooms, four rooms had a match. Each individual room had a 50% chance of a match. The exercise was the equivalent of calling heads on a coin toss five times in a row and winning on four occasions. I've left the community post up so you can check the comments and work it out for yourself if you don't believe me. Let's take this one step further. Try picking on 75 random people and asking them for the date of birth. The chance of a match? It's a hair's breadth below 100%. You could very confidently stake a month's income on a birthday match out of 75 people. From my community post, there were four birthday matches within the first 75 responses. One of the things that makes this a stunning paradox is that our brain is considering the small number of 23, or in the previous example, 75, and comparing it to the much larger number of 365, which is the days of the year. Plus, we're probably imagining everything from our point of view in the room, maybe wondering if anyone matches our birthday. You and the rest of the room will only make up 22 pairs for comparison. But the number of pairs within the room are far greater than we can initially consider. I think that's why this is such a powerful paradox. Let's try to get our head around the mathematics here. I may well get some of this wrong and no doubt people will correct me in the comments, but I'm gonna have a go. For the purpose of this video and my limited mathematics skills, I am going to assume there's no leap years. 23 is a small number compared to 365, but we do need to stop and consider how many pairs are created. To work that out, we can use the equation n times n minus 1 divided by 2. That will give us the number of pairs. n, in this case, is 23. So that's 23 multiplied by 23 minus 1 divided by 2. Or put more simply, 23 times 22 divided by 2. That gives us 253. That's 253 pairs, a number more than 10 times greater than 23. Let's just test out that equation with just six people in a room. Here's Andrea, Brenda, Charles, Deborah, Ellen and Francis. That's 
15 pairs created from six people. Or using our equation, that's six times five divided by two equals 15. So we can prove that this equation does work. Let's remind ourselves what the equation looks like with 23 people. 23 times 22 divided by 2. 253 pairs. Now let us look at those 253 pairs in terms of probability. If you are sat in a room with one other person, the chances of you having a different birthday are very high. 364 divided by 365 gives us 0.997260. Expressed as a percentage, that's 9 99.72606% against a birthday match. But it's not 100%. There is a chance, however slim that might be. So the chances of avoiding a birthday match in a room of two are pretty high. There's a 99.7260% chance against you having the same birthday. But that's just comparing one pair. We've just established that by having 23 people in a room, we're going to have 253 pairs. Let's do the maths. 0.997260 to the power of 253. That's 0.997260 multiplied by itself 253 times. Thankfully, a calculator can do the work. as a percentage, there is now a 49.95% chance against there being a birthday match in the room. Let's invert that. It's a 50.05% chance of a birthday match in the room. In a room of 23 people, the chances of two people sharing a birthday are 50%. It's a paradox. Something that's quite often completely at odds with what your logical mind expects. Please allow me just 15 seconds to plug this channel. Very Nearly Interesting is a brand new channel and I need all the help I can get. Please hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. That's how YouTube knows you like it and they'll show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way we might see you again. And please stay for our bonus feature, the Ben Franklin Effect. Do people really like you more after they have done a favour for you? That's coming up. There's a psychological phenomenon that sees people liking someone more after they've done a favour for them. It's linked to a cognitive bias and it's been known about for over 200 years. As fantastical as the notion might sound that you can initiate something that makes somebody else like you more, it is backed up with a scientific explanation and it's been proved to be true in countless studies around the world. So if it's that big of a deal, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about the Ben Franklin effect. Benjamin Franklin was one of the greatest intellectuals of the 18th century, possibly even of all time. What a man. He was one of the founding fathers of the United States. He was a signatory to the Declaration of Independence. He wrote some of the Declaration of Independence. He was a writer, a scientist and a newspaper editor. Quite how he found the time to be a prominent politician as well is beyond me but he was. In the 1760s, he served in the Pennsylvania Assembly, rising to speaker in 1764. Politics then, as now, was a messy business. Collecting enemies was easy, but there was one particular man, a rival legislator to Franklin in the Pennsylvania Assembly, who displayed particular animosity towards him. Franklin never named the man. He talked about how he dealt with the situation in his autobiography, along with what he described as an old maxim, which was, he that has once done you kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom yourself have obliged. In other words, getting someone to do you a favour is more likely to make them like you than if you did a favour for them. That does sound counterintuitive. Let me just repeat that. Getting someone else to do you a favour that you're not even going to repay is more likely to make them like you than if you did a favour for them. Franklin went on to say that he had heard that his rival legislator had in his library a very scarce and curious book. I wrote a note to him expressing my desire of perusing that book and requesting he do me the favour of lending it to me for a few days. He sent it immediately and I returned it in about a week with another note expressing strongly my sense of the favour. When we next met in the house, he spoke to me, which he had never done before, and with great civility. And he ever after manifested a readiness to serve me on all occasions, so that we became great friends, and our friendship continued to his death. 
So Franklin dealt with the situation by asking his rival for a favour. He asked for a favour and he did not even repay the favour. He let it hang there as an unrepaid and outstanding act of kindness on the part of this man that Franklin himself had initiated. Surely if we want to be liked, we need to shower them with favours. That's how you get liked. Well, it turns out that no, it's not. Before we try to make sense of it, let's have a look at something from the field of psychology called cognitive dissonance. It's the mental toll and anguish that we can feel when faced with the perception of contradictory information. Cognitive dissonance is psychological stress caused by two things that are inconsistent with each other. We then go out of our way to reduce the cognitive dissonance so that they become consistent. We do that in four main ways. Let's say I'm a big supporter of a particular celebrity. I like his shows and everybody knows it. But it's just been on the news that he's done something awful. Continuing to like the celebrity whilst also acknowledging the awful thing he's done creates cognitive dissonance. Mental stress, because the two things are inconsistent with each other. Now I've got four main options to resolve the cognitive dissonance. I can change my behavior. I can decide that I'm no longer supportive of the celebrity. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can justify his behavior to redress the balance. I can decide that his behavior wasn't really that bad and it's all been hyped up by the press anyway. And after all, we are all human. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can justify my behavior. Hey, it's the shows I like. This bad thing is nothing to do with that. I can separate those two things out. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can ignore or deny the new information. There's no way he did that bad thing. Did it even happen? It's a conspiracy. Cognitive dissonance resolved. So what has cognitive dissonance got to do with the Ben Franklin effect? Well, the cognitive dissonance is between the subject's negative attitudes to the other person and the knowledge that they did them a favor. If I've just done a favor for someone, I need to know that I like them. We reason that if we help others, we do so because we like them. We do this even if we don't like them. We must resolve the logical inconsistency. We must balance out the cognitive dissonance. In 1969, a study of this effect was carried out. Students were invited to take part in a competition by a researcher, and they were told that they could win money. A third of the students who had won were spoken to by the researcher, who asked them to return the money. He explained that he'd used his own funds to pay the winners, and he was running low on cash. Another third were asked by the secretary to return the money. She said the psychology department was running low on funds. The last third weren't asked to return the cash. All three groups were then asked how much they liked the researcher. Overwhelmingly, the group who had been asked by the researcher himself to return the money liked him the most. But if we ask someone for a favor, aren't we showing weakness or even vulnerability? Well, not according to countless self-help books, which say that asking for a favor can be perceived by the person as complimentary, as it shows you admire and respect them. So maybe there's two forces at play when we ask someone for a favor. It's causing someone to resolve a cognitive dissonance about us, whilst at the same time raising their view of us because we've shown them admiration and respect. Again, counterintuitively, it's our own actions towards someone that shapes our perceptions of them. You tend to like people to whom you are kind. Psychologists test this out at the University of North Carolina in 1971. Subjects were asked to teach students to memorize sequences tapped out by a drumstick. Each subject was given two students to teach. For one, they were asked to provide support and encouragement when they got a sequence correct. For the other, they were asked to scorn and ridicule them if they got a sequence wrong. Afterwards, all of the subjects were asked which of the students they liked the most. Overwhelmingly and across the board, the subjects said they liked the students to whom they had been supportive and encouraging. They were deciding who they liked based upon their own behavior. Nothing to do with the people they professed to like or dislike. The Ben Franklin effect has been observed in countless areas, such as politics, sales, and even personal relationships. Logic might tell us that doing favors for others 
will cause them to like us. But let us remind ourselves of the words of Ben Franklin. He that has once done you kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom yourself have obliged. Even if they don't have warm feelings towards you, they'll redress their cognitive dissonance by liking you more. After all, you don't do favours for people you don't like. Added to that, their perception of you might improve because they perceive that you have shown them admiration and respect. So there you have it. Want someone to like you more? Ask them for a favour. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, please click the like button. That way YouTube will show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way I might see you again. And please have a look at some of the other content on the channel. There's lots of interesting things on there. Well, very nearly interesting.